Welcome to Versus. My name is Colin Sandberg, coach of the Endurance Collective. I'm joined as always by Ben Turrets, coach and founder of the Endurance Collective. Today we have a special guest, Michael Rayner, president of the Raleigh Dietetic Association and an Endurance Collective affiliate. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Wow. Yeah. Now I'm uh, the outgoing president of the Raleigh Dietetic Association. So, uh, yeah. oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the year just cycled over. So. Gotcha. But, and I was, I was fortunate enough to actually be on one of Michael's podcasts, what, about a year and a half ago? Yeah, it's been a bit now. Oh, cool. The tables are turned. Yeah, I know. It feels <laughs> weird to be in the hot seat. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so it's been a while since our last episode. I actually moved and um, I have a dedicated office now with no furniture, but I did, however, bring along one thing. Yes. My my quilt. So uh, send in your decorating ideas to Colin at theendurancecollective.com. Um, <laughs> before we get started, I'd like to point out that Ben, because of his license, is not allowed to give nutrition advice. Um, is that correct, Ben? Yeah, I can give general recommendations, but uh, because of my licensure, I have to defer all of that to Mr. Rayner, as he is the licensed expert on this podcast. Okay, so does that mean for this episode, you have a gag order, or can you comment, or can you... Uh, I can talk about my personal ask experience. <laughs> questions in the hypothetical. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so obviously nutrition is just this, it's this huge, huge topic. And, um, I mean, we could probably do 50 podcasts on this and I think it would be really easy to go off on a bunch of different tangents. Um, but nutrition is something with so many endurance athletes, so many people I've known and worked with that, um, just quite honestly, they're, they're so dumb about. Yeah. It's like they spent <laughs> all of this money on a Ferrari and they don't put gas in the gas tank. Um, yeah. Michael, can you give us a brief explanation of why, why that might be? Yeah, well, that's that's actually a great, uh, a great setup because as you started talking about it, I had like, I was thinking in my head and it lined up perfectly with that, that segue. So um, I think because it's not easy. The nutrition stuff's not the easy stuff. It's easy to go buy a nice pair of race wheels. It's easy to go buy the Nike 4% shoes, you know, like it's, yeah. that stuff's easy, but nutrition is different for everybody. Um, and what works for you, Colin, is not going to necessarily be the same thing that works for you, Ben, or for me. Um, everybody's nutrition needs are different. Everybody's hydration needs are totally different. And so it's just, it's not as simple of a process. And I think some of it's people don't like that. People don't like that it's not simple. But at the same time, if you can figure out what works for you and what you need to do, that's one of the biggest things you can unlock to, to take your performance up a level, if not multiple levels. Yeah, great. Um, so we struggled a little bit to uh, try to limit our scope for this episode. And <laughs> what I was thinking is, you know, the, the thing I wanted to try to focus on and it's just something so many athletes, so many endurance athletes, so many people I've worked with and myself as well have struggled with is just simply getting in enough energy and fluid during, specifically during races and longer high intensity training. Um, so let's start with this and maybe you kind of answered this <laughs> in your last reply, Michael, but um, is there sort of a rule of thumb or a, a general guideline for how much um, someone should be taking in in terms of energy and fluid during a, during a race? Or event? Yeah, I mean, you'll see general guidance out there, but you'll see it as like these huge ranges. You'll see anywhere from like 20 to 60 grams of carb an hour, and that's like a, a giant range. Um, so really, I mean, you can, you can put general guidelines out there, but it's really so independent and it's so variable person to person. Um, you see it with fluid needs. Um, you'll see people lose as little as eight to 12 ounces of fluid an hour. And you'll see other people lose in a hundred ounces an hour, um, and everything in between, uh, same thing with, with calories that depends on your metabolism, um, your like effort level. Um, so 250 Watts for one person 
is not the same like perceived exertion as 250 watts for somebody else. And so if 250 watts is, you know, approaching your FTP, then you're going to be burning more energy than somebody who that's their, you know, easy, slow day. Um, so the, the needs just vary drastically, um, which is why I think it's important for people to, to figure out their individual needs. And I hate, I hate that answer with nutrition. Cause that's like the answer to so many questions is it depends on the person. Yeah. Um, it sounds like such a, but that's the intelligent answer. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you feel like there's a really common place where people get this wrong, get this, this fueling question wrong? Yeah. So I think a lot of people aren't taking in enough fluid, um, from a hydration perspective and then fueling, I think you kind of see two camps. You either see people really under fueling or people way over fueling, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting. You wouldn't think that that would be a problem because, you know, if you're a cyclist out for a five or six hour ride, if you're a runner out on your 20, whatever mile long run, you wouldn't think that you could over fuel, but, um, and, and you not necessarily necessarily taking in more energy than you're burning, but you're taking in more energy than your body can process. Um, so those two are not necessarily equal in terms of what you're burning and what you're able to actually process while you're working out. And um, that's where people kind of get themselves in trouble sometimes is taking in more than their body can really process. And then all of a sudden you've got GI issues and sloshing and all that kind of stuff that's super unpleasant and nobody enjoys. So uh, on the hydration side, how would I go about figuring out what you said? You said it's highly individualized. Um, if I were to come to you and, I, and said, I, I want to figure that out for me, what does that look like? Yeah, well, this one, I, I like this because this isn't like a cop-out answer. It's not like beating around the bush. <laughs> this is a super simple thing you can do. Uh, so just weigh yourself before and after your workout. Um, over the course of like what I tell most people is usually pick like an hour workout. If you're going out for like an hour, hour ride, doing some intervals or something, or, you know, a 30, 45 minute run, something like that. Weigh yourself before you go out, weigh yourself when you get back. And over that short of a period of time, any weight that you lost largely is going to just be fluid. So, you know, um, if 16 ounces is a pound, say you lost two pounds, you need to be taking in 32 ounces over that, that time period. Would you vary that test in different seasons? So, you know, 16 yeah. ounces in October here in the South is different from 16 ounces in July. Yeah, for sure. So that's because that's such a simple thing. That's actually something that once someone has their fueling and hydration plan figured out and they feel like it's dialed, that's a great check that you can do on any of your longer workouts or middle distance workouts, middle time length workouts. Cause it's so easy. You just weigh yourself before and after it's not like some big hoop loss. You can do it. You can do it after every workout if you want to make sure that you're hydrating properly and everything and to get your, your fueling and hydration plan kind of dialed in. Um, but definitely something worth repeating every season pretty much because based on environmental conditions, so heat, humidity, rain, any of those type of things that'll affect your sweat rate. So kind of how much fluid you're losing. It also affects your sweat composition. So like the concentration of sodium, uh, potassium chloride, um, all of those things are affected by environmental conditions as well. So, so if we've got fluid loss, how do we go, you, you mentioned sweat composition, how do we figure out, you know, I know Infinite is one of the brands that always, you know, ask people questions like, you know, are you a salty sweater? And yeah. how do you more scientifically figure that out? Yeah. So really, um, you can kind of get at it by doing that. You can kind of guess like, Hey, if I'm a salty sweater or if I'm leaving salt stains on my clothes after a workout, I pretty much need to be taking in really high sodium. Um, so you can kind of go about it that way and experiment a little bit. The other option is something like a sweat test. So, um, essentially what you do is you collect some of your sweat, send it off to a lab and they tell you the concentration of your sweat, uh, as far as those electrolytes go. And so then, you know, per hour or per bottle or whatever unit you want to break it down into, you know how much sodium chloride, potassium, uh, depending on the lab you send it to, you may also get uh, calcium magnesium in there. Um, but typically those are lost in a much smaller amount. So really your big ones of concern are going to be like sodium chloride, potassium. Um, so what happens if you get that mix wrong? So what you often see is 
dehydration is obviously a big problem. Like I think a lot of people are not getting enough of those electrolytes. Um, if you look at most people's losses versus most of the products on the market, uh, those products are not providing as much as they really need um, for a lot of people. I mean, granted, again, this is where that individual variation comes in and you'll see people losing hardly any sodium per hour. Like they could go a whole workout, a whole four or five hour workout and only, you know, drink one bottle of sports drink and be fine. But then you see people losing insane amounts of sodium. Like they have to be just sweating like beads of like straight cable salt <laughs> with the <laughs> amount that they're losing. Um, but typically what you would see is like dehydration. And so with dehydration, some of the signs that people like miss is when those electrolytes are off, um, it can actually, you know, nerve impulses require proper balance of electrolytes. So if electrolytes are way out of whack, you'll start to see things like numbness, tingling, um, things like that. And funny enough story anecdotally, like just recently I had a friend that I work with, um, who, I've been screwing with her bike fit. She was like, there's gotta be something wrong with my bike fit. I'm going out for these like longer rides and I'm getting numbness and tingling. And she screwed all around with the bike fit, like longer stem, shorter stem, messing saddle height up and stuff. I was like, are you hydrated? She's like, I don't know. Can that cause numbness and tingling? I was like, yeah. So she's sure enough, she goes and gets hydrated and like does a really good job on her next long ride. No, no. problems. Yeah. So um, at what point, if, if I weigh myself before and after the ride, uh, at what point is there enough weight loss that I should like go to the hospital? <laughs> <laughs> so a hospital is definitely when you start to see some of the other signs, like if your pee is like really, really, really dark, um, or if there's like blood in it or anything like that. Um, but you know, just for general purposes, if you're doing that pre post way, um, we want to adjust our fluid intake during workouts to keep our total weight loss during a workout to less than 2% of our body weight. So if you take that final or your beginning weight, subtract out your final weight, and then whatever that weight is divided by your initial weight, right. then you're getting your percent weight loss. So we want that to be less than 2%, pretty much no matter the, the length of the workout. Um, there's been a lot of research that at 2% weight loss is when we start to see performance declines. Okay. And then those performance declines start to increase the more of that fluid that we lose. Yeah, and I, I feel like, as Ben said earlier, in the, the winter, um, you know, at least outdoors during the winter, um, and spring and fall, no problem. But in the summertime, you know, if I go out in the, the hot, the middle of the day, it will easily be over 2%. So mm -hmm. I, I think the question that I have and a lot of people have is like, how much should I really work, you know, to keep it under that? Because it's not always easy, you know, even right. just out on a, um, an endurance ride, you have to plan places to stop and to keep that level of uh, hydration up in the summertime. I mean, I feel like that is sometimes stopping every, every hour. Yeah. Which is, which is difficult out in the, out in the country. Um, and then in races you have, you know, I can only carry two bottles on my bike. So then I either need somebody to feed me in a feed zone. Not every race has a feed zone or I need to wear a camelback or something hydration pack, which is hot and uncomfortable and slips off. Or I can carry a bottle in my back pocket, which I also don't like doing. Yeah. It's also, it's, you know, uncomfortable. So, and then, in, you know, if you're doing a mountain bike race or gravel race where you've got significant technical portions, you can't always even reach down for that bottle. And I, I, I guess it's just like, I sometimes wonder how much it's worth it. You know, how many sacrifices should I make? Is it worth the extra weight, the extra stops, uh, the discomfort to, because if I don't do that, I'm going to have some serious issues. Yeah. So, I mean, that decision point is different for everybody, right? Um, I mean, one person may not feel so bad at two and a half percent weight loss. And so to them, not worth carrying and two extra water bottles on their ride and stopping twice as often. But, you know, someone else may see a greater performance decline at two and a half percent and may decide, you know what, screw it. I'll carry two extra water bottles. Um, I will say the extra weight, definitely worth it. Your performance declines at 
3%, 4% weight loss. Um, above that, you start to get like the mental fogginess, irritability, things that are going to make you want to cut your workout short anyways. Um, like those kind of things, well worth it to just carry the extra bottle or two. Um, I mean, it's goofy. People, people want to be pro, right? Like they don't want to stick the rear hydration system on their bike, but shoot and training, like whatever it takes to, to get the job done and not get super dehydrated. Um, I, I don't know. I, maybe I'm at a point in my life where I'm not so worried about like what you other don't just people go back to the car. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it, that's the other thing that you can do. Like that's such a simple thing is park your car somewhere and like have a loop. Like if you're going to do six hours of riding, pick an hour loop and just go by the car five or six times, you know, over it to the, to the car. Yeah. Exactly. And I'm talking yeah. about going back to the, to the team car that's following me. Yeah. What there I'm you go. To... I mean, you know what? There are some training groups around here where one of the coaches will ride around with them in his car. So, I mean, if that's, if that's nice. what you want to do, hook up with yeah. one of those groups. Nice. <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure Colin's wife would be cool with that. Yeah. <laughs> she actually doesn't have anything better to do. <laughs> Just uh, looking to, to help me out. Um, so on Let's talk a little bit about uh, the energy side um, and the, the food side. Um, I would say I rely pretty heavily, if not ex exclusively, most of the time, at least in racing and you know high intensity events, on really high sugar stuff: um, energy drink mix, uh, gels, and chews specifically. And I do, and I would say most of my, most of the athletes that I coach primarily do shorter, you know, one to three hour events. Um, but I've noticed, especially with the popularity of gravel and a lot of those gravel races getting longer, um, that, you know, we're suddenly people are, are experimenting with doing, you know, six, eight, 10, 12 hour races. And I wonder because, I mean, I know at the end of three hours, I often feel like if I eat as much as I planned, I'm, I've got some minor GI problems. I'm not feeling great at the end of it. I feel like, okay, I can get through three hours, but I wonder for the longer events, you know, how important it is to start bringing in real food. Yeah. So, um, I mean, some of that's going to be individual tolerance. There's definitely people, you know, looking at like Ironman distance races, even, um, who can do strictly fluid sugar energy for that entire problem or the entire length and not have a problem. Um, but again, that's kind of where the individual piece comes in. Like some people, anything over like two hours and they need something real, they need something to chew on something even mildly savory, just to not be just chugging sugar. Um, but the thing to think about too, is that we want to keep it fairly simple, depending on the length of the race. I mean, obviously if you look at hundred mile ultra marathon runs and stuff like that, um, the, the time period there is so long that you, you do need some, some real solid food. Um, but for, especially the shorter distance races, like you talked about the one to three hours, um, we really want to keep it pretty simple. We want it to be things that we can quickly break down because, as the, if, if the intensity is higher, like you see with those shorter distance races, typically, you know, someone's half Ironman pacing or they're, you know, crit pacing, it's going to be very different from a hundred mile road race or a full Ironman. Um, so as those distances get longer, typically your intensity level comes down a little bit so that we're not just driving ourselves into a hole. Um, but at that shorter distance, higher intensity, we want to keep things simple so that keep things keep moving through our gut quickly. We want to be able to absorb those calories as quickly as possible, the electrolytes, the fluid, and just keep moving. And what we see is if we take in protein and fat during exercise, it slows that process down. It slows the digestion. It slows the movement of those things through our intestines. And that's where you'll start to see some of the GI issues with people. You see it really commonly in, you know, I, I've worked with a lot of triathletes. And so I think pretty often about triathlons because there's some very unique demands there especially with the length of the races um and so that's a pretty common thing there where people come out of the, the swim having not taken any nutrition in for that entire period and then they try to make up for it on the bike so they're kind of doing double time taking down food drinks not exactly easy to eat when you're swimming <laughs> no, no 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 and that's not at all a criticism it's you know it's a unique challenge of the type of racing 
Um, but they try to make up for it on the bike and, you know, they're taking in more than they can really process. And that's when you start to have it back up because it's not moving as fast as you're putting it in. Um, you start to get the sloshing in your stomach, feel terrible, bloating, things like that. Yeah. And of course with the run, since it's weight bearing, seems like, I mean, you can, you can eat, but it's not as easy as on the bike. So I think a lot of people are trying to load up as much as they can in yeah, one section. For sure. And then, you know, again, that's one of those unique demands and talking about like the gravel racing too, you know, that's one of those where you might just have to, if you need to eat some real food, you know, the smoother sections and technical sections, you might have to, to go without for a little bit or, you know, somehow find a smooth bit to take a, you know, couple of sips of water kind of thing. This is, this is an area where I'm always shocked as a coach. And, and I guess it's just because of the, the bias of being in cycling for so long, but, you know, getting new athletes and they had been doing two, three, four hour rides and not eating a damn thing. Yeah. Um, and wondering why they're feeling so, so bad and their, you know, performance just dives after two hours. Yeah. And it's just like, are you eating? No. Okay. <laughs> Huge low hanging fruit. Yeah. Uh, you know, right away, um, instant performance increases for people. Um, and, and I'll encourage, cause I coach a lot of mountain bikers. Um, I encourage them to just stop. Yeah. If, if they're not an experienced rider, um, you know, and I'm also a big fan of personally real food. Um, you know, especially for, for longer type rides. Um, the biggest thing I learned riding in Europe was eat food. Um, yeah. you know, paninis, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, uh, I mean, those are actually some really good points. I mean, that's one of the things that's really interesting is I've had, I've had people tell me, you know, I don't take hydration on anything less than an hour, or I only take a bottle for two hours because I'm trying to train my body to use less fluid. <laughs> Not how it works. Yeah. What you're doing is train your body to perform terribly. Right. Um, and like you said, it's, it's low hanging fruit. And I think the other thing to think about is, you know, at the very beginning of this, I said, it's a little bit more complicated, right? Like that's why a lot of people don't tackle this is it feels more complicated. But the other thing to think about is anything is better than nothing. If you are currently just drinking water, switching to a sports drink for longer workouts, that's going to already be a huge improvement. So once you've mastered that, then we start playing with the amount of sodium, the amount of carbs and stuff like that. But, you know, this can be small steps and you just have to be willing to work at it and then continually refine it until you find what works for you. Um, it doesn't have to be something where, you know, we have to get down to the very milligram of sodium, um, you know, because that's not necessarily realistic anyways. Do you, do you think there's kind of like a set and, and, you know, we've talked so much about this being very individual, but is there a, a set time where you might introduce a sports drink over just drinking water or introduce food uh, as opposed to riding without food? Yeah, definitely. So that's a really good, good question. And it's something that comes up a lot. Um, so typically that kind of decision point for me happens around an hour. If it's a workout less than an hour, you can kind of get away with just water, mm -hmm. but that also, you have to look at that kind of holistically in the bigger approach. So if you're doing a shakeout ride in the morning and then you're going to hit a hard workout in the afternoon, you should probably go ahead and drink a sports drink on that hour ride in the morning. So we're not digging ourselves in a hole that we're trying to combat in the afternoon. But if it's your easy recovery day, maybe you have an off day the next day, you can do just water on that hour ride. Um, it's not as crucial. Um, the other thing to think about is, especially in North Carolina, it's really bad. Heat, humidity, we want to start introducing those electrolytes along with our fluid a little bit sooner. So more like a half hour. Mm -hmm. So that's one of those that like really surprises people, like especially runners, like runners hate carrying things with them when they're running. And I get it. Like it is super, like it sucks carrying a handheld, especially if you need like two, like you're just running around like with <laughs> wrist weights, you know, like nobody enjoys it. Three hands, man. Yeah, exactly. But, um, it makes, it makes a big difference. Um, so, you know, if you're, especially if you're not running super early when it's still cool, like if you're running at eight or 9 AM, um, go ahead and do a sports drink. Um, just see how you feel, see how you tolerate it. And I would, I would bet most people feel better doing it. Um, so that's kind of, you know, just to kind of summarize that piece, if it's less than an hour, you can usually get away with just water. Um, but obviously there's the bigger picture. If it's, 
backed up to other workouts or you've already been kind of dehydrated. And if it's hot and humid, anything over a half hour, I'd probably switch to a sports drink instead of just water. Um, and there's very few times that I recommend somebody doesn't take fluids with them. That's especially like a th consideration for runners. Most cyclists don't head out without at least one water bottle, but for most runners, if it's more than a 20, 20 minute run, you, you should be carrying something just, so you're not getting dehydrated. Um, cause any period that you're not drinking while you're running, you're sweating. And so you're just getting dehydrated that you're going to have to rehydrate from later. So make your rehydration process a little bit easier and just carry something with you while you run. Um, as for the food perspective, that again, kind of circles back to someone's needs. Um, so if someone is using a sports drink that has electrolytes, it's got carbs and that's meeting all of their needs. You don't really want to also introduce food with that. If it's again, meeting all of their needs. So if they find a sports drink, sports drink that works really well for them, tossing food on top of that's just going to slow down that digestion. Like we talked about and back things up. But typically, if it's more than two to three hours, you'll see people start to, to want or need a little bit more than just what's in their drink. So I used to coach a, a junior cycling team, and I would give them, especially for their, their longer road races, um, you know, some basic nutritional plans. It was not admittedly highly individualized, but I might say aim for, you know, 40 to 60 grams of carbohydrate per hour. Uh, or 300 to 350 calories. The race is going to be about three and a half hours long. So here's how much you're going to do. Let's lay out, you know, how many bottles of energy drink, how many gels, chews, bars, whatever else you want to mm -hmm. eat. Where's the feed zone? Where are the places on the course where you can and can't eat and drink? Um, and of course, I get so frustrated that at the end of the race, they empty their, their jerseys and everything that they brought with them pretty much maybe except for one gel would still be there and i'd be like why didn't you why didn't you eat anything and they'd say oh i didn't i didn't feel hungry or i felt like you know my gi was i was already having gi problems um because i was i was riding hard uh but then they were cramping up at the end of the race or something right and my my advice was always just like look better to have some GI problems than be cram and feel mildly dis <laughs> mild discomfort than cramping at the end of the race. Um, but there's got to be a, a line there, right? I mean, obviously, like you said earlier, um, you know, having you don't want to be puking because you ate too much food either. Yeah, you have a way of knowing what the what the line is. You know, how far you should really push it. Yeah. So some of it's, you know, again, knowing yourself, um, and kind of what you're able to tolerate. But, um, the thing to think about is also just being realistic with yourself. Like if you're going out for a two or three hour road race, it's a big field, you got double yellow line rule, you know, it's going to be a tight pack. You're not going to be able to drink a lot. Like that's one of those things where if you know that you're not going to be able to do as much during the race, you really got to be prepared headed into the race. Because if you know that you're not going to be hydrating properly during the race, if you head into the race dehydrated, you're just stupid or mil <laughs> misinformed, not yeah. to be mean to anybody. But like, that's like saying you're about to go on a road trip and all the gas stations on the route are closed. And so you started the road trip with an empty gas tank. It like, doesn't make any sense. I think I've done that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, so it's, it, and it's a planning piece. Like, that, again, this circles back to it's not necessarily an easy thing to do. You're already planning out your gear, you're planning out your kit, you're planning out team race tactics. And so now you've also got a pile of nutrition on top of that. So that's why it's really important to use every training ride as a chance to hone that nutrition. So you don't have to put as much effort in when race day comes around. You kind of know, hey, I, I do pretty well drinking 24 ounces, one bottle of X product every hour. Like that, that seems to get me pretty good through my workouts. So that's what I'm going to plan on for race day or I need to do that plus a salt pill every hour or whatever it is, whatever you kind of land on, hone all that in training so that it's less of a factor in racing. And that's also where training, that's where those hour shakeout rides, that's a chance for you to practice the muscle memory of just taking some of that nutrition in every so often. Like some people break it down into 10 minute intervals, 15 minute intervals. But if you can practice that in training, then when racing comes around, you kind of just muscle memory, pick your bottle up every 15 minutes and you're drinking from it instead of, having to worry about what everybody around you is doing, worrying about team tactics, and then you somehow have to remember to pull your bottle out and drink from it. Yeah. 
Now, to what extent can you actually train how much energy you're capable of processing? Um, you know, I've heard a lot of people talk about that, that you can get that up, you know, maybe from, uh, I've heard some people say, even with some athletes up to 90 grams of carbohydrate per hour, if you really work on training that. Yeah. Yeah. So you can definitely train that same thing with the fluid tolerance and how much actual volume of fluid you can process. Um, for most people, that kind of upper point tends to be about 40 ounces an hour. So with a lot of training, people can get to 40 ounces an hour. Some people can get a little bit above that, but for most people, even with, if you train it, hone it, you're not going to really be able to process more than 40 ounces of fluid an hour. Um, same is kind of true for those carbs. Like you can work on it, get that up, but for most people, you're not going to be able to take more than the 90, even if you really train and hone it. Um, and the other thing to think about is as that intensity goes up, that number comes down. Um, so as intensity goes up, there's more blood flow into the working muscles and less going to your stomach. And so digestion slows down just as a natural product of that, um, which is, you know, it's in group races where you're racing against other people, not necessarily against like the clock. So, um, like triathletes, good example. If you're starting to get some GI upset, you can back off the intensity a little bit until some of that goes away. You know, you get blood flowing back to the gut and kind of process some of that, and then you can ramp it back up. But in a crit and you, you, you settle off, you're going to be gone from the group. Um, yeah. same thing with a road race, you know, like you kind of, the intensity is dictated by the race, not by your needs. Um, so there's obviously some unique challenges there. And that's again, why it's really important to head into races as prepared as possible. Um, but yeah, so definitely, definitely something to work on and train. So if you, and that circles back to the weigh test, like the pre post around a workout weigh in, um, if you find that you're losing 60 ounces an hour and you've only been drinking 20 ounces an hour, definitely something you need to work on, like slowly with your rides, slowly work on getting in, you know, maybe it's. 24 ounces an hour, you switch to big bottles. Um, then it's a bottle and a half per hour. And then maybe you get up to two smaller bottles an hour. Um, so you just slowly work your way up as you tolerate it. Um, and if, if you're not tolerating it, back, back off a little bit. And it sounds like you're saying it's generally a better idea to train that on your easier days. Um, or would you, are, are you saying every time you're, you're training, it's an opportunity, whether it's high intensity, low intensity, you know, long, short? Yeah, that's a great question. And that's the way I view it is that every training session that you're training fitness aspects, right? Like you're doing intervals, you're doing VO2 work, you're doing, you know, easy spins to shake your legs out. Those are opportunities to also train your nutrition at those intensities. So easy rides, that's a great chance to practice drinking the total volume that you need. Um, it's also a good chance to just practice drinking at regular intervals. As those intensities go up, that's a good chance for you to train your body to process a little bit more at those intensities. Um, and again, just knowing that, you know, there is kind of like a top point, you know, it's not realistic to drink three bottles an hour when you're at your FTP. Yeah. Um, in terms of these high sugar content uh, supplements that, like I said, a lot of us are, are relying on, how much does the, the composition of that sugar, the type of sugar matter? Or, I mean, I've heard some people say, you should just eat Swedish fish because they're a lot cheaper than, you know, the, the, products specifically marketed towards athletes um you know is that just a gimmick or is there something with a lot of those those products that's worth paying the extra money for yeah it uh that's a personal decision you know it kind of depends on what your priorities are um i kind of had the same question for myself geez probably probably about a year ago i was just like hmm, out of curiosity i wonder what like not to pick on any companies but like scratch gummies i was like i wonder how that nutrition compares to just like some gummies off the shelf at the grocery store and nutritionally just about the same, just about the same amount of sugar, just same about the same amount of calories. The thing you're getting with something like scratch is real foods. It's real sugar. It's not super highly processed sugars. Um, you're getting, you're not getting artificial coloring, dyes, flavorings, things like that. 
Um, so that's what you see kind of across the board with most of the like engineered sports products is kind of a shift to be a little bit more natural. And they'll also typically supplement in some electrolytes to kind of help you meet your, those needs, which you don't see with, you know, jelly beans off the shelf. Um, obviously they make their sport beans, but with just like plain old like jelly bellies or, you know, the gold gummy bears, um, you're not seeing some of those other steps that are taken with like those engineered sport products. But from a nutrition perspective, they're, they're just about the same as far as grams of sugar, calories. Is there something to be said for having a strategy of having multiple sugar sources? So some are burning more quickly, some are taking a little bit longer to burn as opposed to a single source, or does it really just come down to getting in the, getting in the, the energy and the electrolytes? For most people, it comes down to getting in the energy and electrolytes. And we've also found that from like a, uh, metabolism and usage perspective, especially with sports drinks, that as long as there's two different types of sugars in there, um, that we can process it a little bit faster and absorb it and utilize it a little bit faster than if there's just one type of sugar. So interestingly enough, if you go look at most of the sports drinks on the market, they're going to have at least two forms of sugar because they caught on to that. Um, and most people have applied that. So as long as you're buying, you know, any reputable sports drink, um, you really from that perspective, don't have to worry about that. Um, as far as like, if you're adding foods on top of that, you know, whether it's gels or gummy bears or, you know, some other product, um, it's, it's not as big a consideration. That's just in the pursuit of meeting your total calorie needs. Um, do you find there's a difference, Michael, between, um, you know, like, you mentioned Scratch before. They have a, a what, super fuel product that's like a high carbohydrate mix. And so am I losing something if I am if I have that in my water bottles versus uh, uh, specifically water bottles for hydration um, over the course of, say, a three-hour road race? Um, am I better off taking in calories out of my back pocket versus a bottle? Yeah, that's going to, a lot of it's going to come down to individual person. I mean, you look at companies, I don't, I'm not trying to like point to too many companies, but I think a lot of people know these companies. And mm -hmm. so it's easy to like kind of relate it to a specific product. So I'm not necessarily like promoting any one product, right? It's more just to use these as examples, but look at infinite, like their whole model was super high calorie so that you're not having to take gels. You're not having to take food along with it. Um, and that works for some people. Some people really don't want to screw around with packaging and eating and chewing and things like that. And they seem to tolerate just the fluids really well. You look at other people and they really just need their drink to provide some calories, mostly electrolytes. And then they really want to chew something they want to eat. Mm -hmm. um, so someone like that, the super fuel or the infinite is not going to be such a great option because, you know, it's just going to kind of overload their system to try to eat on top of that. Um, but and some of it's the nature of the racing, right? Like if you're in a 90 minute crit, like something like that's a good option because you're not going to also be able to chew an open packaging to eat foods. Um, or, you know, to your point, Colin, of like a super technical race, like whether it's mountain biking or something, you know, having something where it's kind of your one-stop shop for your fueling and hydration, that, you know, can be a big benefit. Um, but if it's something where you've got the time, you've got the desire to, you know, drink your hydration and eat your fuel, then that, that could be something that's really useful. Yeah. And I think, um, you were talking about training to, uh, to take in the nutrition you need, but part of that is just the mechanics of it too. And, you know, reaching back into your Jersey, unwrapping something, seeing if, if, if that works, practicing that, uh, ride yeah. without, you know, at least one hand on the bike. I mean, I think that's, you know, a good point as well as, you know, there's other demands outside of strictly just your needs, right? Like, and that's kind of something that we've gotten at, but, you know, the type of racing you're doing is going to also maybe dictate the products that you need to be taking in or using um, just from like a physical perspective of, I can't deal with packaging while I'm, you know, going through technical single track sections, whether that's running or riding. Um, but if it's, you know, hundred mile road race, you might have the ability to open packaging and 
pick up feed. So you're only having to carry a couple of bottles or whatever that is. So some of it's figuring out the type of racing you're doing and kind of practicing and preparing for that. Um, and as far as like packaging and stuff, that's again, a, a place where those shorter, easier rides are great opportunities to practice that. Um, you know, again, going back to scratch, they have like their cookbooks, you know, with the rice cakes. And that's been like a popular thing for a lot of people. And they make them, they stick them in their pocket, but they've never tried opening the packaging. They've never tried unwrapping them while they're riding. Yeah. And so then they're not eating them because they can't open the packaging. So again, using some of those rides to practice, pulling stuff out of your pockets, opening it. And you may find that there's some things you need to do differently in races because of that. Yeah. So like from a personal perspective, I really, when I was racing, enjoyed the cliff shot blocks, you know, the, the two packaging are all just like in a line, you squeeze it out was really simple. I liked that. But what I found is I couldn't open those packages while I was racing. Like it just, I didn't, I wasn't able to rip it open well. Um, so I, before races, road races and stuff, I would cut the tops off of all of those and then just fold the top flap over. Um, and so I just pre-staged my food, like knowing that I wasn't gonna be able to rip it open during a race. And so that's the kind of things that you finesse and work out in training. Yeah. And I think the conditions come into play too, you know, temperature, if it's raining or not. I mean, I've seen people say, oh, I don't mind eating a, a sandwich in the <laughs> middle of a ride. But then if it's raining, you know, you right. pull that out of your back pocket. It's not, not very fun. Or, or if it's 95 yeah. degrees, you know, a turkey sandwich that's been in your pocket for three hours doesn't sound so right. appealing. <laughs> yeah, that Snickers bar uh, yeah. might taste great if you're stopping at a rest stop. But if you have it. Chocolate down here is not great in the summer. <laughs> yeah. I once I went remember the old... Uh, I, the old power bars that you know they had you had to ride with them like in uh, against your skin in the winter otherwise they break yeah. your feet <laughs> yeah that's what i was just gonna say uh then uh when i lived in in northeastern ohio i remember one winter ride where i pulled out a power bar and it was it was like frozen solid and i snapped it and punched myself in the nose and gave myself <laughs> a bloody nose during the ride <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. I don't, gosh, do they even make power bars anymore? Is, is that a thing? I don't know, but I, I had this same kind of experience, you know, like same, those thin flat power bars, oh. cold winter ride, you pull it out, you're like, oh yeah, I'm going to take a bite of this. And you're like, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like peanut yeah. brittle. Yeah. Or I mean, you know, some of it's like your personal needs too. Like I've raced with a guy who had wrecked and he had veneers in his front teeth. And so he couldn't rip gels open. And right. so before a race, he would have to rip the tops off of all of his gels before he put them in his jersey pocket, which made for a little bit of a mess. But um, you learn that stuff. That's the stuff you learn by practicing and training. Or, you know, you may say, hey, this product sounds great. It looks like it's going to taste great. It tastes great when I'm sitting around eating it. And then you stick it in your jersey pocket and all of a sudden you figure out that you can't deal with the packaging or it's too crumbly to eat while you're riding. Um, so those are all the kind of things that you figure out by practicing this stuff in advance. What about timing in a, in a race? Like, you know, all three of us are familiar with stage racing and, and have done a fair amount of stage racing. And, and Colin and I have both been in the driver's seat of team cars, handing this stuff to our riders. You know, I was, I was big on telling my riders that you're not just fueling for that day, but you're fueling for tomorrow and the day after and the day after. So, you know, if you finish the race completely depleted, you know, and don't, don't start immediately replenishing yeah. you know glycogen stores and whatever you're in trouble for, yeah. for the next day um, yeah that's that's a really good point and that's something that i harp on with a lot of my clients um you look at it with especially you know i, I see a lot of around here you see a lot of like middle-aged endurance athletes you know they want to get better at it but they're not they're not going pro they're not making a living at it um and a lot of them also tend to have like some sort of weight loss goal um, whether it's, I want to lose just a couple pounds, lean out a little bit, or you have people that lose, want to lose more weight. And the thing I always tell people is like around your workout is not the time to do that. Like the around your workout, you want to fuel and head into that as hydrate as possible. You want to fuel during your workout and you want to recover from your workout. And then we can look at those other factors. Um, and especially with like stage racing or a lot of people have like a very full training schedule, right? They're training five, six, seven days a week. Um, and so if you're coming out of, especially now, because it's so hot to your point, you know, like people come out of these really depleted, these workouts really depleted. And all you're doing is making it that much harder for you to recover and head into the workout, the next workout. Well, um, and so 
like you said, each workout, you're not just fueling that workout. You're also speeding up recovery. You're making sure that you're prepared for your next workout and can hit that with intensity. Cause what you see is when people are under fueling or under hydrating, typically each individual workout is not so bad, but cumulatively it gets worse and worse and worse and worse until they're just so under fueled. So under hydrated that like every workout's terrible. You talked about, uh, a, a little bit, you talked about post-workout and stuff. So, um, if I, let's say I went for a, a ride and it was kind of hot out and I came back and I lost, you know, 2%, uh, body weight, what then do I need to do to get back up to baseline? Um, and in, and what's the timing associated with that? Yeah. So after every workout, kind of our big emphasis is obviously going to be on rehydrating. So that comes into play with like that 2% weight loss that you talked about. So our rehydration guidelines are a little bit simpler. You're not having to do the percent weight loss calculation. It's really just the amount of weight you lost like in pounds. So if you lost two pounds or four pounds, we want to replace that amount of fluid afterwards. And so for every pound, if a pound's 16 ounces, for every pound, you want to drink about 16 to 24 ounces of fluid to rehydrate. So that's, if you came back from your workout and you've lost two pounds, that's 32 plus ounces that you need to drink in that like hour to two hours after your workout to kind of get that rehydration started. Um, and so all of, I mean, a general rule of thumb for your daily hydration is half your body weight in ounces of water per day. That's without the needs of activity and stuff like that. Um, for most people, that's a pretty good starting place. Um, what you'll see with most of your athletes is even if they're taking off days, that need is higher. Um, their body uses more water from a metabolic perspective. Um, but then once you layer in the activity on top of that, you can see people's fluid needs in a day being gallons of water potentially. Um, so, you know, if we can start that rehydration process quickly, that's going to do good things for recovery, helps flush out the muscles, um, joints stay lubricated, all these fantastic benefits from good hydration. Um, but the other things we want to do after a workout are start to get in carbohydrates to replenish those glycogen stores, the body stores of carbohydrates. Um, we want to start to replenish those because our body doesn't store very much glycogen. Um, even if we, you know, a lot of athletes talk about carb loading before a workout. So even if we do that, most people can only store about 2000 calories as carbohydrates in their body. So it's really not a huge pool of energy. Um, so we can conceivably in a couple of hours, a few hour workout, burn through that whole thing. So definitely reloading and replenishing those glycogen stores after a workout and then getting in some protein as well to help with repairing and rebuilding muscle. So really our big emphasis after a workout is rehydration, replenish glycogen, and then repair muscles with protein. So really those are our big focuses for that really anywhere from 30 to 90 minute period after a workout is where we want to jumpstart that process. And a lot of athletes I see just like kind of related to that is people come back and want to drink like a protein shake first thing and then immediately go into a meal. And if you're headed into a meal, just use the meal, like make sure the meal's got good carbohydrates, good complex carbs, um, a good protein source, and then make sure you're drinking fluids with it. And you're, you've covered your bases there. You don't, you don't necessarily have to chug like a protein powder or some supplement all the time. And to what extent can I super hydrate pre-workout? Uh, I, I know you said, obviously you don't want to go in dehydrated, but is it really possible to sort of super hydrate? Um, yeah, so it actually is. So that carb loading process, um, not as crucial for like an hour long workout or race, because in an hour, we're not going to burn through all of our carbohydrate stores if we're heading into that properly fueled. Um, but for, for longer workouts and longer races, carb loading can help us kind of beef up those glycogen stores. But along with that, our body stores water. So in the process of carb loading, as long as our hydration is good, as long as we're staying hydrated, we're kind of super hydrating to your point before a workout or a race. Um, there's also products out there that are like uh, hydration boosting. Uh, everybody calls it something different. Scratch has their hyperhydration mix. Um, Noon has a new one out. I forget what they call theirs, but there's different 
different formulations of it, but essentially it's really high sodium to kind of boost the body's like electrolyte and fluid stores, but it's only temporary. Like it's, it's a very short period. So doing that the night before a race doesn't really matter. You're going to pee it all off by the time you, you go to race. So that's something that you do over the course of the hour, hour and a half before your race to kind of just get those fluid stores as high as you can for that couple of hours. Can you overhydrate before a race with just water, like flushing all the electrolytes out of your body? Yeah. So, um, that's a bigger concern with endurance sports than most other sports. And you, you run the risk of this condition called hyponatremia. And it's basically where you over dilute the electrolytes in your body and that can cause some like really big issues. So we definitely want to avoid that, which is why you will hardly ever see someone recommend just drinking water on any sort of considerable distance race. Um, you'll see it most commonly with like really long distance stuff. So like ultra marathons, Ironmans, things like that, where someone got the idea to just drink water the whole time. And essentially what they've done is they've diluted the electrolytes in their body down so far that, you know, body functions start to be disrupted because the electrolytes are so low. So you start to have those like nerve impulse problems. Um, in like really severe cases, you can have heart problems because the electrolytes are so off. Um, most people aren't going to get there. Um, especially if you're, if you're doing a sports drink and, and getting, you know, any amount of sodium and other electrolytes in, you're not going to get to that point, but you can definitely, um, monitor your hydration status throughout the day. Like the best way you can do that is just look at the color of your pee. I mean, it is your body's way of telling you what is happening in your body. Uh, so headed into races, workouts, we want our pee to be a really light yellow, a pale yellow color, but we don't ever want it to be clear because clear means that we've just got more fluid than our body really needs. And so we're dumping fluid, but not as much of the waste. Like that yellow tinge to your pee is the waste being flushed out. Um, so we want, you know, a pale yellow color. I usually tell people lighter than the color of pale lemonade, but not clear. So if it's clear before you head into your workout, kind of back off that fluid a little bit. Um, like if your pee is clear and you're headed into a three or four hour ride, maybe you kind of just wait a little bit longer to start your hydration during the ride until your body can kind of get back to equilibrium. All right. Um, so we usually like to end these episodes with a, a, a short, you know, fun question here. I've got a nutrition related one, sort of food related one here. Uh, pasta versus rice. Ooh, that's tough. Uh, but if I have to pick one, it's going to be rice. I love rice. I imagine from a nutritional perspective, pre-race meal, it probably, it does come down to personal preference, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're both, both good carb sources. There's nothing to be scared of either way. Um, what about you guys? I'm, now, now I'm curious what y'all's responses are. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a rice guy. I always, you know, if I have a big pasta dinner, I feel kind of lethargic the next day. Um, so I, you know, big, big stir fry is my, uh, my, my go-to. Yeah, I kind of agree. I mean, I don't mind, uh, I like pasta is a big general term, you know, so something like a, a, a piece of lasagna I could really go for, uh, <laughs> heavy on all the other stuff. But yeah, if I have too much plain pasta, I feel a little weird. I feel stuffed and then I feel hungry again 10 minutes later. Some of it's like a quantity thing, I think in my mind too, because it's like if you eat pasta, like even if you eat a big serving, it's like what, 60 pieces of whatever it is, if it's like penne or rotini, you know? Whereas rice, if you eat two cups of rice, it's like a million grains of rice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, chicken parm used to be my go-to. But, uh, you know, as, as I've uh, matured, it, it, I think, uh, you know, more, more of a good chicken stir fry, uh, you know, Thai basil stir fry, something like that. Yeah, I like the simplicity of rice, too. Like, we have a rice cooker, and so you just set it and forget it, whereas, like, pasta, you don't want to boil over. That's right. All right. Well, thanks for having cool. me, guys. I really appreciate it. Yeah, I mean, yeah thanks, thanks, uh, for, thanks for doing Mike, it. Somebody... This is awesome. Um, I, I could almost see. <laughs> we lose you, Colin? We're on <laughs> Hillsborough Internet? Yeah, we're. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if uh, it's just me. I think or... we lost Colin. On my end. <laughs>
<laughs> Perfect timing. Anyway, uh, Mike, if somebody wanted to um, utilize your services or, or talk to you, how would they get in touch with you? Yeah, so you can drop me a line to, uh, let's see, uh, hello, H-E-L-L-O at RainerStrengthAndNutrition.com. Um, it's the easiest place to get in touch with me. Um, and then, Ben, what's the, I don't, I, I want to send them through the correct site, but I don't want to say the site wrong for them to like find my yeah, services. The Endurance Collective.com. Um, you know, you, you can um, ask us info at the Endurance Collective.com yeah. is kind of the general, <laughs> the, the general catch all for questions. Um, and, you know, the, the cool thing is Michael is going to be doing a lot more work with us. Uh, you know, we're, we're sending our athletes to him going forward. He's, he's going to be our, our resident uh, nutrition expert when it comes to performance nutrition. So we're, we're super stoked to have him and, and um, we'll, be, we'll be posting a little bit more about Michael being part of our team uh, in the coming weeks here. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of one of the missing cogs in, in the EC machine right now. Well, I'm super appreciative and excited to be on board. Um, I, as I've gotten older, some of my focus, like as I was younger, you know, my focus was on doing the best I could in races and getting as many racing experiences as possible, you know, going to nationals or racing international races. Um, and as I've gotten older, some of that's shifted and, and I'm really passionate now about helping people achieve their goals. Um, and, you know, I, I've had a fairly varied background in sports. Um, so I bring some different perspective, but I also understand the demands, you know, I mean, we got into some of it today, but like, I understand the demands involved in running. I understand the lack of desire to carry a handheld or a camelback everywhere. Um, and so I, I think that's something I do particularly well is having that perspective and being able to help people find solutions as opposed to, Hey, you need to take in this amount of fluid, figure it out yourself. Um, hugely important for us to have that perspective and it's you know it's it's the reason why we have Colin here it's the reason why you know we have the the coaches and the therapists that we have is is because they all have some sort of experience in the sports we all do and we all coach and, and work work with yeah so I'm super excited to be on board so I appreciate you guys having me here cool man